Hey, what's up guys? Welcome back to the Game Engine series. Excited to be back. Uh, January is now over, it's February, which means that the work, the real work is beginning. It's the official start of the year, as everyone knows. Um, yeah, let's just jump into it, because we've got a lot of stuff to do. Um, we're basically going to be continuing on with the text rendering stuff that we started, like, I don't think it was last week, because I didn't stream last week, like the week before or whatever. And we're going to basically just, uh, so what do we do actually? Let's take a look at that first. So last week we, I think we basically just got MSDF gen and MSDF Atlas gen actually working. We linked them up. We did some stuff, meaning like we did some, I was going to say practice code, but like some test code just to make sure that the library was working properly and we could actually generate this. And I think we even generated like a little, um, did we save, did we do this? I think we did. We would have, right? I don't really see it here, but presumably we had it generate a file for us, which I think I remember seeing it, but it's not here, which is confusing. Where did we call this from? I don't even know. All right, beautiful. Um, but we got all this stuff working, and I think we also took a look at the MSDF, like, what was it? We took a look at the, like, the console program they have that lets you generate these kind of atlases. And we decided that we're going to kind of copy that. Um, but what we're actually going to do is probably take a look at how Big Hazel does it. Um, at least somewhat. Just because that is going to save us some time. But I did explain how I would do it from scratch. Uh... So we're going to try and like, in general, I'm going to try and steer clear of looking at too much big hazel code, just because in a way it's cheating. I mean, it's not really cheating because I am the one who wrote this code earlier, but it still is cheating because you're not really sure, you're not really seeing my entire process. Um, but in this case, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to almost make an exception. Uh, it is all contained within one file. For those of you who are patrons and have access to the hazel uh, to Big Hazel, then you'll see that it's all in the font.cpp file. Thanks, Peter, for the sub. 20 months. Nice. Appreciate the support. That was awkward. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, and I, I guess what I'll do is I won't show you guys the code. We actually looked at it last episode a bit, so you can go there, but I, I'll, I'm going to kind of rewrite all of it from scratch so I can explain it as well. So we're going to probably start with that. Okay, cool. I think I'm pretty much ready to go. Um, so there are a few uh, ways that we can set this up. So first of all, like, I guess free type does need to be initialized. So it's important that we do this at some point, but obviously this is one of those things that really only needs to be initialized once. Um, the other thing though that we could do, which is uh, what I believe Hazel Dev is actually doing, or Hazel, Big Hazel is actually doing, is I think it's basically initializing free type just to load the font and then it deinitializes free type, which is a function called deinitialize free type, which calls ft done free type, which is a free type function. Uh, and then deletes that. Now, whether or not that's over, like whether, I, I don't know if we want to leave free type initialized during, like, I don't even know what that does to be completely honest. Like, what does it do? Probably just allocates some memory. So we could definitely just do this once, you know, on engine startup or the first time we could do like a lazy loading thing where the first time we decide to load a font, it initializes free type and then doesn't ever destroy it or doesn't ever free it or deinitialize it until like the very end of like the whole application or Maybe not even at all, because what does this do? Just freeze that memory, right? Ah, uh, let's see. Mm. I mean, it does seem to shut down some modules and stuff. Maybe it is important, I don't know. Who knows? It's hard to tell these days. <laughs> uh, so, either way though, we can definitely start with this and end with this. And obviously, if I guess free if free type doesn't initialize successfully, so if this is false, I think we can just go ahead and move that to be like, basically like we can just do a core verify or something. Um, that's the thing, right? 
Oh, we don't have verify, so we've only got asserts. Okay, well, we'll just leave it as an assert for now, just to make sure that's valid. Uh, otherwise, that'll be bad. Um, and then we have a file path. This is like our font file path, so that's fine. Which way take in like that. And then we can actually load the font. Um, which we also, I guess, do here. And we get a font handle, which is good, because we can kind of use that. Um, and then do we do load... Okay, so we don't do load font data, which is what we need to do. So we do load, load font to get the font. Which happens somewhere, yeah. Oh, actually, it already takes in the font, no. I'm trying to read my own code, and it's very confusing. Oh, here it is. Load font data instead of font. Okay. So there's load font, but then there's a function called load font data. So it loads a font file and returns its handle versus loads a font from binary data and returns its handle. Oh, I see. So this takes in, obviously, a buffer instead of a file name. Um, I think we can just use load font. Dev uses load font data. Uh, one of the reasons it does that, actually, is because it needs to, since... Um, and we'll need to do that as well, because eventually fonts are probably going to be packaged as part of like our asset pack, in which case we basically need to read that as a buffer and then give this a buffer. Um, so I'll leave a little note, just so that we're aware that that function exists. But we'll we can just use this for now. Okay, so we get our font, um, and I mean, we can probably just like say something here, like, um, H set core error failed to load font. Um, and then return, because that's kind of a fatal error, at least with that. Okay, and then we go through and actually load like various glyphs, which is not what we're gonna do here. So I think basically the purpose of this is just to open it, and then at the end we can do destroy font and de de initialize free type. This part I don't think we're interested in. I'm gonna just deactivate it for now. <clears throat> and we're gonna see how we can actually load a whole bunch of glyphs and generate an atlas with it. Yeah, sorry guys about the early starting. I just figured that I, to be honest, didn't really look at the time. I forgot that it's scheduled for like 15 minutes from now, but, you know, whatever. <laughs> you guys can watch the VOD. Um, so, uh, let's see. What's next? Um, yeah, so that's what that does. That's cool. There's all this garbage. We have some character set ranges, which we probably will need to do. And then we can actually tell it, I'm assuming, to load that character set. And then there's also this font geometry, which comes from most of data glyphs. Where the heck does that come from? Okay. Interesting. Okay, well, let's try and load the glyphs, I guess. Because, I don't know, like, th there's basically three stages to this. There's opening the font file, there's loading all the glyphs you need, like, which I guess will, I don't know, like, will load them from the font file, but maybe not rasterize them yet. Not 100% sure. And then we need to pack it into an atlas as, like, signed distance fields, basically. So there's a whole bunch of stuff we need to do, I guess. Um... Yeah. So, let's start with the glyphs then. There's so many parameters as well. Like, damn, this is... Yeah, obviously so much stuff to do. Um, okay, whatever. Yeah, so there's this thing called font geometry. Because the other thing that's going to be really important... To, to us, right? And font geometry is located where in font geometry? Where was that? If I was doing such font geometry, maybe. Yeah. Um, and font geometry, 
is like the other thing that's going to be important to us is to actually be able to also have font metrics, right? So we need to be able to like measure text basically and 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 know like um and kind of know like you know how far apart characters should be, whether or not they should be like, you know, if we're drawing like um and the reason why this is so important, give me a sec, I'm going to get my little drawing tool up is because if we draw like you know, if I want to write Cherno, yeah, there's a few things at play here. Like, first of all, like, well, this actually might be a, a, a simple example, to, to be completely honest. Let's think of something uh, different, like uh, flight. So we have a word called flight, right? So, first of all, you might notice that this F is a very different width to this I. Right? And same with this I. Actually, that's an L. <laughs> oh, uh, so this F and L are different widths, obviously. This G has to kind of be lowered um, as opposed to these, these other ones. And obviously, they're also different sizes, meaning like this H is taller than the T. And so what happens is when you try and draw this as a quad, the quads themselves are different sizes and they, they have to be in different places. So the F might be this, the L might be this, the I might be this, the G will be like this, right? The H might be this, and then the T might be this. So what we need to do in order to draw this text is we need to basically generate these boxes. Um, like we need to create, and these are quads, right? So they're actually made up of two triangles. This is like the quad or whatever. We have to create this actual geometry on the fly using our 2D batch renderer when it's time for us to render this kind of character by character. Of course, it'll be batched into a single draw call, but it'll still kind of be generated character by character. And so in order to do that, we need to know, and of course, it's going to vary and differ like font to font. So we need to basically, when we load the font, we also need to gather this information so that we actually know like all of the extents. Um, and there's like, honestly, font metrics can be like, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. It's not just as simple as maybe some of the stuff I've described, but at the very minimum, we obviously need to know the actual bounds uh, relative to probably the baseline, as well as um, the the kind of extent. So how much forward do we move to draw the next character and stuff like that. So those are all things that are going to be really, really important um, to kind of think about. So, because of that, um, yeah, we just need to make sure that we also load this stuff. And font geometry, I believe, um, so what it does is it actually takes up, it takes in a vector pointer called glyph storage. And this is actually for the geometry of all glyphs, so it will actually store them in here. And when you do load glyph set, I guess it will use this as storage. So this is not like an input, it's kind of like a, you, it's a pointer to some storage. So what, and specifically to a vector, because I'm assuming it's gonna do, it's gonna resize the vector to what, it, to what it needs itself. So what we need then for this font geometry thing is basically a vector of this thing called glyph geometry, which is also inside MSDF Atlas Gen. So if we go over here, private, we'll make a vector of glyph geometry. And I don't know, we'll just call this glyphs or something. Uh, we'll, we'll include MSDF Atlas Gen and what is it? Glyph storage or glyph geometry. That should be that. And of course, we need the MSDF Gen namespace. No. Oh, is it in Atlas Gen? Where was that? What was it called? No, MSDF Atlas. Gotcha. And this is upset now. And this is also upset. Really? I thought those were legit. Aren't they? Ah, no, they're already, I think, in... We're already in that directory, I think, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, and so then we can just basically... Uh, I'm also holding the geometry here which I guess is fine, um, in something called MSDF data, which I'm assuming is there because, oh, right. Because one of the things that I actually didn't want to do, okay, so here, I'm going to show you guys another trick here. Um, so one thing we probably want to avoid is having an include 
inside a header file like this. Because if we do that, what it means is that um, if we want to use the font API inside like say Hazelnut or inside the runtime or inside a game project or whatever, then if we include font.h, it's gonna need to include include glyphgeometry.h, which of course is part of MSDF Atlas Gen. And so suddenly we then need to provide an include directory for this library, even though MSDF Gen and MSDF Atlas Gen are kind of supposed to be like, you know, backend implementation details. They're not like, you're not supposed to use the MSDF Gen API, like kind of client side. That's like a Hazel internal thing. Right, and so by by putting this include here, unfortunately, what it means is that we need to actually uh, also carry that across to anything that it might include font.h. And so to avoid that, what we can do is we can obviously move it to the CPP file, um, and then for this, the reason we included it in the header in the first place was because we needed a vector of this type, right? And there's a few ways around this. So what I like doing is anything that is kind of supposed to be opaque, so like you're supposed to have a black box of just data that is like, in this case, related to MSDF gen, what we can actually do is basically create a struct, right, um, called like, you know, MSDF data. And then inside that struct, we can put in everything we need. And notice how I'm creating the struct, uh, such as these glyphs. Notice how I'm creating the struct inside the CPP file, right? Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is, instead of containing this, all of this in the header file, here I'm just going to have an MSDF data pointer called like M data or something like that. And then because that needs to exist, I can forward declare it over here. And so what I've done is I've created a pointer to something that technically doesn't exist in this header file and whose implementation is somewhat unknown, but it's just a pointer. So it might as well be a void pointer or like a UN64T because again, it's just a memory address, right? Um, and then what I can do is I can have the implementation hidden away here, which implements everything I need. And the only real difference is of course, I need to create this now when I create font. So I need to allocate storage for this by using something like new. Oh, and you probably, I don't know if we can use like a unique pointer with this because it might require the implementation. Maybe it won't. Um, cause that would be even better cause then we don't need to delete it. So if I do like make unique MSDF data, not that there's anything really wrong with deleting the other thing. Let's just see if this compiles. Yeah, I think it does. Okay, good. So you can see that what I've done is I've just moved this into this kind of unique pointer, right? Called M, called M data, and then I'm allocating storage for it here. And then when I want to use it, all I have to do, like for that kind of glyphs thing, is just access it through M data instead of like directly through the class member, if that makes sense. So like in terms of like performance implications, like of course you are creating a, a like an indirection here because now your kind of class font is actually storing a pointer to a buffer that contains your members instead of it kind of just storing your members in line. So there can be some like issues with this, I guess, if you're really pedantic, but in general, it's not really um, that much of a problem. Now, the other thing we could have done, obviously, and we couldn't have actually done it in this case, but you can obviously do like some other weird things like store a vector of, like if this was a pointer, then you can kind of forward declare that. Um, of course, we're not trying to store pointers. We're trying to store the actual object kind of in this buffer. So it's very, it's completely different. We can't really do that here. Um, but this is, this is usually a nice solution because it lets us kind of, you know, black box away all of the kind of, uh, actual implementation details and just hide them behind like this kind of, in a way, undefined pointer, um, over here inside the, uh, header file. Let me just probably include like file system or something. Cause I'm just noticing we need that. And I don't know if we need memory for unique pointer. Um, but we'll, we'll see. Okay, cool. So that's glyphs. Um, and then what we can do, cause the other thing we wanted was the actual font geometry. So we can also just kind of include font geometry here and call this like font geometry or something like that. This, maybe just geometry. Cause of course it's font geometry and it's inside the font class. But basically if we do font geometry equals, um, you know, MSDF Atlas, is that it? MSDF Atlas font geometry. And then we call that with M data glyphs, right? 
um, we now have that being created with that storage. Right, so that's kind of made that work. Cool. Oh yeah, you're right. We can, instead of make unique, we can just do, um, and instead of unique pointer, we can use scope. I forgot about this. <laughs> um, which I think is in a, where is that? Inside like, whoops. Inside like base or something. Yeah, base. So Hazel called base, I'll include that. Um, and then we can do create scope. No, no difference, obviously. It does the same thing. Um, okay. So, thanks for pointing that out, NEP95. Um, okay, so, yeah, then we, the next thing we need to do is actually load, like, a glyph set or a character set. And this is going to depend on, uh, basically what kind of character set we use. We're going to be using a Unicode, Unicode code points, though, to represent our glyphs. Um, so, we'll probably just do, we'll call load, uh, character set. Um, so we need the font handle, which will just be font. Um, we need a, some kind of scale for it. Now, again, I'm going to turn to this to see what's up. Uh, so the font scale is, I think it's just one, basically. So let's just use it. We can bring it out here. What is it? A double. Font scale equals one. And then we need the actual character set, right? And the character set is this thing called a, a char set. So it's this class here. Um, and you can see like it kind of has its own iterator here. Um, and it just contains a bunch of Unicode T kind of code points, which are just UN32 Ts. So to generate these, um, this is going to basically define what characters we actually want to load from the font. Now, I believe the way that I did this was like I went into I am GUI. And... I think there are some things here that define which character sets to load or whatever. I don't remember exactly where this is, but I know I took it from I'm GUI because when I took it, I left a comment in the Hazel code being like, this is from I'm GUI. Maybe I can just <laughs> try and find it by the actual code. Charles at Rangers. Hmm. Let me try and search this solution for that and we'll see what happens. No, I really can't find it here. How interesting. I don't know where I got it from. It says that I got it from I'm GUI though. Unless it's in like widgets or something. Nah, it probably should be inside. Or maybe it's an internal. No. for the word char is not very helpful either. It's going to be used a lot. Where does it like do the font stuff? Is that inside here? Get font. And font, font atlas add font. Where is that? That's an I'm GUI it looks like. Yeah, here's some glyph stuff for a font atlas as well. Glyph. Oh, here we go. Glyph ranges builder. Aha. Uh -huh. Helper to build glyph ranges from text string data. So this is kind of cool. Um, and I believe they should have some already built or whatever. Well, this is all here. Well, what's what does add text do and stuff? 
Maybe I did do this. I don't rem exactly remember what... Oh, here we go. Here we go. I found it. I'm going to draw .cpp. So you can see they've got a bunch of things here. Get Glyph Ranger Cyrillic. Get Glyph Ranger Thai. Vietnamese. They've got all these things. Um, and this is like, wow, Japanese requires this. Wow. That looks very complicated. Um, base Rangers as well. Yeah, so there's lots of stuff here. Uh, so default is kind of like ba basic Latin and Latin supplement, whatever that means. Um, so we we basically need. So this is, I guess, this is yeah, like our basin kind of basic basic basin basic kind of Latin characters. And then if we want other languages, we can also kind of get these. Okay, cool. So we can steal these. Um, so this is like the range, I guess, of characters we have here. And I think we need that zero. Well, I'll, I'll just copy this whole buffer. Um, we'll go to, we'll go to uh, our file. We'll change this to be just a UN32T because that's what it is anyway. We don't need the I'm GUI specific type def. Um, and then I guess we can just set it to that, which should hopefully mean that, um, yeah, like that'll contain, I think that's everything we need to begin with. Like Hazel, Hazel also supports Cyrillic. Um, I don't know why we specifically support Latin and Cyrillic. I think it's just because I speak English and Russian, so it makes sense. <laughs> but, um, of course, like we could basically support anything the font supports. Uh, if we just tell it what to load. So, that's probably how it should work. Um, so, in that case, but you can see here, we need to give it a character set. We can't just give it this, like, range. So, if this is our char set ranges, right? Um, and again, I'll leave a little comment here saying from... Uh, maybe I'll just say specifically this time, I'll write... <laughs> so I'm already improving Hazel. In Hazel, in Big Hazel, I just wrote from I am GUI, which is why I struggle to find it so much. This time I can write from I am GUI draw.cpp. So there we go. Now we know <laughs> a lot more uh, accurately where that's actually from. Um, yeah, and then like the... Ca so for the character set itself, uh, what that means is that we actually need to go through this and kind of add it to the character set, all right? Um, so we can create MSDF, uh, is it an MSDF Atlas? Yeah, so we need to load, load, load the, um, uh, character set stuff as an actual character set thing. So, char set, uh, is inside MSDF Atlas. I don't know if I should just use a namespace MSDF Atlas, but the, on the other hand, it's really good to see, like, what it is. Um, like, for each kind of specific thing we use if it's from like MSDF Atlas or MSDF or whatever. So once we have the character set, I think we can just loop through basically in range equals zero, i is less um, than. So, not i, range is less than. So we only have two at the moment. So we're just kind of trying to loop between these. It's just we might have more, so I'm kind of writing this in a way that works with that, I guess. Um, and then once we're inside, so that's just going to loop through, uh, those guys. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, that makes sense. And then we can just do plus equals two here. So the idea is if we have multiple, this outer for loop for range will basically go from this one. This will be index zero, this will be index kind of one. Well, it'll be two, but we're going by two, so that makes sense. So basically this initial code will just loop through. This will only, this for loop will only be executed once for kind of this range. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll go through, uh, char set ranges, uh, range, um, all the way to, uh, C less than equal to, um, char set, because we need to include that range, um, or include that value. So it'll be range plus one to get to the end of the range. I don't know if we could have just... Like, of course we could have been more descriptive here. We could have made like a struct called char set range, um, which uh, basically just had like, you know, a kind of begin and end. And then that way, you know, if this was, um, if this was uh, char set ranges like that, then you could kind of just have, you know, this, for example, uh, and then, Instead of this situation, 
which let me finish writing this, and then we would do char set dot add uh, C, right? And then instead of this situation, we'd basically go through each char set range here, which um, I don't know if we should probably do something else for that, but whatever. And then instead of going through like this, you could have just gone through range begin, you know, range dot end. And that's kind of the alternative, right? So this kind of is a bit more, I guess, descriptive, begin end, you know, we've got the char set range here. This is a bit more manually dealing with integers, but I don't think it's a huge thing. Um, cool. So yeah, I'll get rid of this. We'll just keep the simple version. Um, or maybe not. Like, why would we, right? Yeah, let's keep the better version. How about that? This is now not exactly the same as in, as, it, as it was from I'm GUI, but whatever. That should add all of those characters, hopefully, into there. Um, and then we can pass in that character set into this function, and that should be it. Like, this should now have everything here. Um, and this actually returns, uh, well, it returns an int. And the int is just going to, I'm assuming, be the amount that it loaded. Yeah, so it loaded plus plus, and it probably returns loaded. So um, if we want to kind of glyphs loaded, if we want to just keep track of that, uh, hz core info, you know, loaded glyphs from font. And we could even say out of that many, right? Because we kind of know how many we want to load, I guess. Well, that's... That's how many we're, ex we're kind of uh, expecting. So, does this, can we just ask this how many? Yeah, we can. So then in that case, we can just say loaded or glyphs loaded and then char set dot size, right? So this will be interesting to kind of see. Okay, I think we can just run this. Um, hopefully I, I don't know where this is coming from. Hazelnut, at, like where did I load this? Edit a layer? Yeah, here it is. So we did try and load it from here. So if we call that, and then maybe at the end of this, let me just do hz core assert false, so it stops. And we'll see how many glyphs we load from this and whether or not it works or whatever. Okay, use of undefined type, msdf data. Yeah, okay, so there we go. So maybe you can't use that with this. I thought that maybe you couldn't. Um, in which case, we'll just have to use msdf data like that, um, and then we can create a new buffer. And in the destructor, which we don't actually have at the moment, we can delete it. All right, well, we got down to here, which is good. Um, and yeah, so loaded 191 glyphs from the font out of 224. So that's pretty good. Um, we're clearly loading something. And the reason why we may not have loaded the other ones is just because the font doesn't contain those glyphs, which is fair enough. It depends obviously what you request and what font you, you were using. Okay, um, so the next step uh, is we can actually even set a name for the font geometry, which is kind of interesting. Okay, I'm just reading some notes that I left for myself. <laughs> um, okay, so I think we can just probably pack the atlas next. Um, so for that, I think we need this, we need to create something called an Atlas Packer. And then we call pack on that. What's the point of all this? If it creates it later anyway. Huh. 
What's the point of this? Doesn't that do the same thing? Huh. Hold your horses, people. I don't know, like I'm looking through Hazel's code and there seems to be like we seem to be pa packing everything using something called a tight atlas packer. But and and I guess we do we do get the dimensions from it. I guess that's why we do it. And then we use those dimensions later in order to in order to know like the size of the atlas that we want to make. So I'm assuming we do need it, but it's almost a bit suspicious. But whatever. So let's do MSDF atlas. Tight Atlas Packer. And then we basically will. There's something called a set dimensions constraint, which we can set. I think we either set the dimensions or a constraint. So we could set it to be like a multiple of four square, like power of two. I don't know if we need to set a constraint, to be completely honest. Let's try not doing that. Um, set pixel range. So in this case, it was set to like two. Don't know why, but sure. These are just some default values. Um, what is this, for example? Def default mitre limit. Don't know what this is. Like, what is this? For bounds computation. What is it by default? This is not set at all to anything. Well, I guess all these need to be set then, because they're just not initialized. Right? Ah, uh, here, you can kind of call try pack with that stuff. And default might limit apparently is one, actually. These are just defines that they had in the, in the file, in the, uh, in the thing, in the console application they had. Um, so set padding, I guess zero, it's either zero or negative one for some reason. And then what's fixed scale, this music's great. Uh, also, the EM size that we, the M size that we used, was was forty. For some reason, that's just like the size that seemed to produce good results. <laughs> like, as in, it was high resolution enough. I'm enjoying this music actually.
All right, let's see if that works. So then we can basically do... Well, I'm actually checking to see if there's anything remaining as well. But sure. Um, so remaining should be zero, basically. So in remaining equals atlas packer dot pack. So we, we're going to we're going to basically try and pack this stuff. And if there's anything remaining, we can handle it. So m data uh, glyphs dot data because it's a vector. And then also it I think wants this as an int. So we'll get the size. And if remaining greater than zero, for now we'll just assert false. I guess we can just assert the remaining is exactly zero. If it's negative, I think that's also bad. <laughs> um, I don't even know how that's possible to, to get that. And then from here, we can actually, assuming it's worked, we can get the dimensions of the atlas. So width and height. So this is actually now going to be the uh, size of our texture, basically. Um, and then we can also ask it for the scale, which I guess we will override our M size with. Um, so I guess let's try and run that to see. I, I don't know if that'll work. I feel like this is not enough parameters for it. But we'll see. No, well, it didn't crash or anything. So what's our width and height? 512 by 512. Okay. Um, and the scale is, yeah, 40. Okay, good. So that seemed to work. And remaining, I guess, wasn't zero because it didn't set. So that that's good, I guess. Um, and the last thing we should do is actually, like, create the atlas from it now. So I guess we've figured out how to pack it. But now we need to actually create the... This is going to be the performance intensive part where we actually rasterize the glyphs, I guess as sign distance fields. So to do that, um, we're going to basically write a function up here, which is going to return a texture. Um, so how good is our texture API? I'm assuming we can just create a texture with some data, right? Well, yeah, we've got set data and we can create width and height. There's not no information here about any formats though. Ooh. This is beautiful. Okay, so, um, let's do this then. Let's pretend it works. So, this is going to be pretty wild, but we're going to write a template. We're just gonna have a type name T, type name S, int N, generate a function S N, which is gonna be our gen func. Static ref texture 2D, create and cache atlas, const SCD string, font name, float font size, we'll grab our, our glyphs, I just leave this as a big line. Const font geometry font geometry const configuration. No, oh, we don't need that. Or do we? Well, it's just we. Yeah, I think we probably will. So this configuration is just like a little struct I made just to contain everything. Because there's a lot of stuff here, as you can see. Um, and this generator function is going to be something that comes, I guess, from... I think it's an MSDF atlas. Yeah. So we can pass in a, a, one, like a generator function that it provides, so that way we can generate... We can use this one function to generate any... What, we can have this one function call 
a specific generator function that's going to generate the type of atlas we want, basically. Um, okay, so texture 2D, that's just in Hazel. Yeah, and this configuration thing. Um, we'll see what we need from it first. How about that? Because I didn't actually end up making it this time around. So, yeah. Um, okay. So, basically... MSDF Atlas Immediate Atlas Generator. S N Gen Funk MSDF Atlas Bitmap Atlas Storage T N Generator. Yeah, with basically width, width and height, which we'll need. So that's one thing we need from possibly from config. Um, then we do generator set attributes. Yes, yeah, so we have some attributes that we can set. Which, if I check Hazel, what does Hazel do? Uh, so, overlap support true and scanline pass true. Sure. And those are generator attributes. So, let me maybe set them up then. So, scanline pass true and. Does it? like two attributes. What was the other one though? Oh, dot config dot overlap support true. Okay, I don't know why. We'll investigate that later maybe. Maybe. So we set attributes to that. Um, we can also set thread count. So, because this will dispatch it across many threads. Um, I think I just had it set to like eight, so we can chuck that in, but of course we could like try and use all the available threads or like, you know, half of the available threads or something like that by just checking what's available, uh, you know, from the CPU, but we'll just do this for now, uh, and then generate. Um, okay, so we take in the glyphs, so this will be glyphs.data int glyphs dot size um, and then msdf gen bitmap const ref tn bitmap equals cast to that generator atlas storage okay and then I basically cache this to a file because it's too big to just generate every time um, but we won't do that at the moment, but and but all we need is inside the bitmap. So this bitmap will actually have bitmap.pixels, which is all the data, um, as well as like the width and height and everything. So from here we can actually create a texture 2D. So we can do texture 2D create. The width and height, we can do bitmap width, bitmap height. And then we can do texture set data. I don't know why the constructor doesn't take that in, that's a bit of a flaw. So I'll probably make it do that. Um, we should rewrite the whole API though. We should re re rewrite the whole engine to be completely honest, but whatever. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm joking, not the whole engine, but just look, we need to expand like the resources, like textures to actually take in like a specification like Big Hazel does, because there's too many variables um, that we might want, that we will definitely want. In fact, RGBA32F is the format of this. So this isn't even gonna work, I think, but whatever. Um, uh, yeah, and we can, I guess, set it to, like, bitmap.pixels. Um, yeah, so I guess really the only thing we need is the width and height, right? So, I guess I can just take that in. Width, height, and that just goes in there. I think it just uses int for that. But whatever. Um, and then I guess I can return the texture. So that's how we can generate the actual atlas. So let's hit a five, see what happens. I don't know if this will work. Well, it didn't crash, so. It was also very quick though in debug. Oh, we didn't call the function, lol. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so. Let's do this. 
Um, let's do... So ref texture 2D texture equals uh, create and cache atlas and we can do what do we even usually do? MSDF, yeah. Okay, so for that and floating point formats, true. I guess we can do false and it might generate a different type. Okay, let's do that. Let's do this for now. We won't do it as a float thing. So this will be um, UN8T float three and MSDF, uh, I guess MSDF Atlas, MSDF generator. So we'll use that function. Name will be test. I don't know why the name, I don't think we even use the name. The name's like for caching. The, the name is for Hazel's like cached file format, I think, like in the header, basically. So that's irrelevant. Um, the M size. Data glyphs, data font geometry, and width and height. So width and height. Uh, do we just have that? Yeah, we do just have that. Okay. Let's see if this works. It does not take one argument. Uh, it needs a size. Yeah, right. Um, well, assuming it's maybe it's RGB. This is just not gonna work well, is it? Uh, might be RGB, might not be. Do we know how big this is? No, I guess, well, yeah. I don't know if it's times three or times four, let's just do times three. Um, okay. I don't know if that's actually going to be correct, though. Well, it didn't crash. Oh, okay. Well, sure. Hot shot. You think you work? Let's give it a shot. So... Let's just bring this up in here. I did this in editor layer. Just a little temporary hack. Um, so why don't we just, where's our I'm GUI? Let's try and send it to I'm GUI and see if I'm GUI will render this extra um where's all of our I'm gooey stuff sure so where's a good panel render to these stats settings eh. let's do in settings I'm gooey image wait this is open jail right yeah okay not that it really matters I think Wait, if it's OpenGL, then... Okay, yeah, get Atlas Texture, get Render ID, I guess, and then size, like, man, um, 512 by 512. Sure. Incompatible. Oh, because it wants, like... I think it wants that...
Alright, um, yeah. I think, uh, that basically worked. I think it's just RGB, not RGBA. And so that's why there's all this garbage. Um, but you can see, you can kind of see glyphs. They're just a bit weirdly placed. Again, because of the stupid RGB versus RGBA thing. Um, that's not a problem though, to be completely honest. Because I think, uh, this is OpenGL. So OpenGL actually does support RGB, I think. We just need to set the data format to something else. So when we create a, when we create this guy... I think it's just, we just assume it's this for some weird reason, but I think if you did this, and I don't think this is used really for anything else, is it? Because we usually load textures from files. This might just be it, no? Yeah, I think it is. It's just that now I have to go back and make this three. Or not, size four. What size is for? Oh, this is elsewhere, isn't it? Where's my call stack? Oh, we do. Okay, render init actually does this. Sure. Okay. Um, let's not do that then. That was a hack anyway. Let's um, do bool RGBA equals true. Um, this is even worse of a hack. Oh, no. We're going to have to add this everywhere. All right, guys. I'm going to do this properly. Fine. So struct texture specification. Okay, and then here we get to uh, actually set the width and height, which I might just set to one by default. Um, and we're going to set uh, an image format, which do we have that? Uh, no, of course we don't. Um, so, uh, in um, class image format none then we'll do RGB RGBA RGBA 32F I don't know if we just want like red R32 or something um, or R8 or whatever I guess I'll put these numbers here so that we can tell the difference um, but sure that's a few uh, by default, I guess we'll just use RGBA8 or something. That's probably decent. Uh, and then, of course, we'll have other things here like generate MIPS and what else? Like filtering stuff and whatever. Now, R8 is like not necessarily grayscale. It's like, well, it can be. It can be, it's just very often used for. If you're just storing data in a texture and you just need one, like, byte of data per pixel, then you can just pack it in there. Um, okay, so let's see. So now we'll get texture, the constructor, which is here. Instead of taking it with and height, we'll show, we'll keep path or whatever. But um, the idea is it takes in a const texture specification. And you can see there is actually a default spec and you don't have to like, you can have defaults here and then you can just kind of override the ones you want. Um, so now if we go here, we'll just cut that out. And that's great because if you want to add more parameters, you just add them to that specification. And furthermore, uh, it means that we don't, don't have a billion parameters. So I always tend to do this because it's nice, very elegant. And you can also store the spec here. So that way you know, obviously, what everything is. And then since I'm over here modifying all this code, I might as well add a function here. Um, called get specification. Right, and basically this will just, um, th like, the reason we have get width and height anyway is because you might request a certain texture size, I guess, but then maybe you resize it to something else, and the original specification now is different, so that's why we still, get width and height is always the actual width and height of the texture, whereas specification is kind of like what, what it was created with, if that makes sense. That's also why we kind of make, we keep these even though we have that. Um... Okay, and then, yeah, this just means that we need to also implement, obviously, this here. 
and it, that will just return the specification. No. <laughs> that. Um, okay, so now that we have that, uh, well actually let me just set this up first. And we should do that for the width and height thing as well. Oh, sorry, for the, uh, for this constructor as well. Because, um... So, width and height I can set. Because, um... Obviously, like, we might not want to set width and height, say, there, but we do want to, we definitely do want to set things like, you know, filtering or whatever. Um, or like generate MIPS and whatever. There's other kind of parameters there that are going to be important to set. <clears throat> uh, okay, cool. So basically what I'll do here is just really dirty for now. I'll just say uh, if um, if M specification that MSDF app generator is following me everywhere. Uh, if the format is um, well, we can even put a switch in. So if it's, we'll support obviously these two for now. And I should, I would write, normally I would write functions for this to convert each of these. Um, I guess I will like, uh, but we should do this not here eventually. Um, so we'll, we'll say Hazel or GL format Hazel format to GL format. Um, and then we probably also want internal GL data format to GL internal format. Because there's two of these, right? Um, and I think that will just return a GL enum, which is just like an int. Now we'll take an image format in. Okay, so if it's RGB, RGB. Then we return, so what is this data format? So data format's obviously this, um, but yeah, obviously RGB. Um, and then what we can do is, well, I guess we can just return zero and do a core assert false, because that means that we have an unsupported format. And then for this, it's RGB8. Uh, so they're a little bit different. And then this just means that we can do the data format here. Utils, hazel format to GL data format, or hazel image format. I'll call it that. Oh, is, that get, is that getting long? Um, and then we can just pass in format, obviously, into both of these, right? So we go nice and elegant, I hope. Um, yeah, and now we should be able to, everything else just keep using RGBA, right? But what it lets us do is, um, um, we obviously need to now set, it, set in a specification. Now in this case, you can see it's one by one, so it's actually perfect. So they can actually just create a blank <laughs> texture specification, and that's it. Uh, which is a bit dodgy, but sure. <laughs> um, and then back in our font thing. Uh, where we create this guy with width and height, we would need to create a texture sp specification. Um, so spec dot width is that, spec dot height is that, uh, and then spec dot format is image format RGB eight. So without the A, right? Um, and then that's the spec that we pass in here. Oh, and I mean, if we wanted to, we could also set generate MIPS to false because we don't need them for this font atlas, of course. Um, not that we actually generate MIPS, I think. I think we just generate MIPS for... Do we just not generate MIPS for anything? Maybe we don't. Who knows? Um, but that should be false, I guess. Yeah, let's give that a go. I don't know if the engine will compile because there might be other places. Well, I forgot to do that. Maybe not though. All right, it seems to work and run. Hey, and it's perfect, all right? Uh, let's flip it though. So back in editor layer, where we try and draw this. Which is here. 
Let's do I am Vec 2. So I'm passing in the uh, UVs, right? I guess I can just do them like that. Um, and they'll be so 0, 1, uh, 1, 0 instead of. So we flip the Y basically. <clears throat> All right, excellent. Um, and yeah, you can see here we have a whole bunch of glyphs. Um, now, <laughs> to be f completely honest, it looks like we have... Is this all of them? Yeah, I guess it is. Looks kind of low, doesn't it? But I guess they're all there. Like, here are the kind of capital letters. It's just some of them are mixed up. Like, as in, they're obviously in random order, kind of. Like, here's a normal D. Here's a lowercase d, h, k, and l. They've it decided to fit it over here. So that's why they're not kind of in a row and it almost looks like it's missing stuff. But I guess these are all the glyphs. Damn. There's quite a lot of extra space here, which it didn't really have to use. Especially because we didn't add the constraint of it being a square or a power of 2. Because at the moment it's created a 512 by 512 texture for whatever reason. But I guess we can play with that if we want. But yeah, they're all basically there. Um, this doesn't really... This doesn't look like a... Sign distance field, though, I just realized. <laughs> I don't know how I didn't realize that before. This just looks like a normal rasterized font. Atlas. So, that does seem a bit wrong, but... Isn't it weird having my face here, but then also, like, over here? <laughs> it is weird. Um... Adrian Tesla saying, have you solved the big hazel material render rewrite? Uh, yeah, I've, well, it's basically solved. I just haven't, like, finished implementing it, unfortunately, because I've been a bit busy with, like, videos and, like, you know, just taking time off last month. Um, but it's going to be done very soon. Um, and I will definitely make, like, a hazel devlog kind of about it as well. All right, anyway, we've got the atlas being generated. Pretty exciting. Um, we could try a different font. So why don't we, at the moment, what are we loading? Uh, fonts, open sans, and then, yeah, this. So, let me just go into my fonts on my computer. See Windows fonts. And then, uh, let's select... I don't know, what's a fun font? Thanks, Strawberry Love, for the sub. Five months, appreciate the support. Hi, Jan. Hope you're having a good day. I'm new to game dev, but not new to programming. Should I learn game physics first rather than learning 2D visuals? Um, I don't, I don't know if it necessarily matters. Like, just, you can do both at the same time. Just kind of, you know, if you get bored of one, do the other. It's not, it's fun to do, like, physics and visuals together because then you can kind of build an interactive world, an interactive game. If you're just doing one or the other, it's like, you know, how are you going to visualize your physics? You need to draw stuff. And then with rendering, it's like, you know, if you're rendering a world and it has no, like a 2D world and it has no physics, it feels a bit empty, you know? Let's do this like script font. It's inside the uh, Open Sans directory. Let's just put it here for now. Um, <clears throat> try that. So yeah, I would probably I would probably do both and combine them into a single fun game or something. Cause like yeah, physics and rendering is kind of all you need for a game. Um, all right, cool. So there you go. That's another font. Looks like it has more glyphs than the other one, but there you go. We can kind of rasterize fonts. They don't look like sign distance fields, so that we will investigate next time. But that's the way it is. Thank you guys for watching. Hope you enjoyed this live stream slash episode of the game programming game. It's not a game programming series. What is it? The game engine series. Same thing. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Don't forget we live stream these. If you're watching on YouTube, we live stream these like every Monday evening Australian time. Um, I know I'm a bit behind on the uploads, but I'm catching kind of up. I put, I put two, two live streams up last week and they all go up on the Cherno Unplugged channel on YouTube. Um, should I commit this? I should probably commit this. I'll commit this after the stream. Thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.